Good morning and welcome to our webinar, New HR Laws for 2018, What You Need to Know. I'm your moderator, Denise Ketty. A few quick housekeeping notes before we introduce our expert panel today. The webinar is going to run approximately 60 minutes in total. There will be time at the end of the webinar to address some of your questions. If you have questions during the presentation, please post them to the Q&A area on the dashboard. Please take a moment right now to download the presentation content that is available in the handouts area on your dashboard. If you have any issues during the presentation, please email me directly at deniseketty at gmail.com. Today's webinar is being recorded and all accompanying materials are protected by copyright. Our presentation today provides general information and does not constitute legal advice. We recommend that you consult with your own legal counsel to address your specific situation and needs. Let's get started by welcoming our expert panel today. Our legal expert today is Marla Merhab Robinson, partner and head of transactional department at Merhab Robinson Jackson and Clarkson. Marla is responsive, reliable, and respected by her clients and her peers. What sets Marla and her team apart from other legal firms is that she and the members of her team have worked in the corporate world, so they understand the challenges that business owners face on a daily basis, in addition to understanding the legal concerns you have for your business. Next, we have Linda Duffy, President, Ethos Human Capital Solutions. Linda is known as the people problem solver. She and her team are strategic advisors who help business owners with the ever important human resources consulting, recruiting, and training. Ethos Human Capital Solutions is also celebrating their 10 year anniversary this year. Congratulations to Linda and her team on this milestone achievement. Thank you both for being here today to get us talking about this important topic. Linda, can you get us started? I sure can, Denise. Thank you, and welcome, everybody. So happy um, to be here, and I know that uh, Marla and I have done many of these webinars in the past, and we sort of took a break this past year, but we'll be getting started um, back on track more with a monthly webinar or so as we move forward, and we'll talk at the end of the presentation about our upcoming uh, schedule for events and webinars. Um, I want to introduce everybody to Denise. Um, I, you saw her slide up there. Didn't, I've known Denise for, boy, about 10 years, I think, when I first started my business. Um, Denise is awesome. She's a marketing professional. Uh, she helps companies who have little or no marketing support uh, by becoming that marketing quarterback for them so that she can manage projects or programs, building some relationships uh, with in the organization as well as partnering with people outside, um, customers, vendors, whoever, to just handle the marketing overall. So if you're a small company or even a larger company and you need somebody to either spearhead your events or your, just give you some marketing uh, strategy, uh, please reach out to Denise because she is great. Um, so thanks for being with us, Denise. Okay, our agenda for today is pretty straightforward, pretty simple. There's been a lot of updates and legislative changes over the past year, some of which have already been into effect, some of which go into effect January 1st. We're going to talk about those, and then we're going to talk about some case law updates, because we have to always keep our eye on that ball as well, so thankfully we have Marla to do that. Um, as we mentioned, we'll have some time, probably about 15 minutes or so, for any questions you may have. If for some reason we don't get to your question today, we run out of time, um, if it's in that question and answer box on your dashboard. We'll have a record of it and we can follow up with you after uh, today's seminar. Okay, so let's get started. Minimum wage, of course, um, is indexed to increase every year as you can see. We need to keep in mind a couple of key things. We talk about this a lot, so let's just remind everybody of a couple of key points on the minimum wage. Um, there's a difference right now if you have 25 or less employees or 26 or more employees. So it won't be until January of 2023 where everybody will be at the $15 mark. So you have to always keep in mind um, that there's a little bit of a stagger there. Why that's important is because the Labor Commissioner has recommended that if an employer reaches the threshold of 26 or more at any point in a pay period that you compensate your workers at that higher minimum wage for that pay period. 
okay, and then going forward until you drop so below 26. So for those of you that have like right on that cusp, 25 or 26, and you go, well, on Monday we had you know 25, and then we hired someone, and then somebody left on Friday. If you hit that 26 number at any point in time during the pay period, you want to make sure that you're paying everybody at that $11 an hour. You are allowed to drop back down um, if you at no time during the pay period have 26 or more, but that's the key takeaway that you want to uh, think about for this. Remember that certain cities, and I did not put all of them in there because now we're at a place where, oh my gosh, that it seems like every Northern California city is on their own schedule. We have San Diego, we have Santa Monica, we have counties, we have cities, everybody's at their own schedule. So you just want to make sure that you check for your local municipality, county, city, whatever, to make sure that you know what your schedule is. Now I highlighted this, it doesn't go into effect until July 1st, okay, but just remember um, we're at a different schedule, so if I go back, $11 an hour right now for everybody in the state, 26 or more employees, but if you're in Los Angeles, City of Los Angeles, and you're at 13, 25 coming up in July, and right now you're at 12, okay? So it is going to be different by city, by state, and you always have to pay at the highest standard. The other thing to keep in mind with some of these city laws, and this is true for Los Angeles, is that Los Angeles ordinance says that if you have a person who in any particular week performs at least two hours of work within the geographic boundaries of the city, then they need to be paid at that paid according to Los Angeles. So where this comes up for some of our clients is, let's say drivers. You have drivers that make deliveries. The company may be based in Orange County, but if they're driving through Los Angeles, who doesn't sit in traffic for more than two hours a week? If they're driving into Los Angeles to make deliveries, if they have clients that go you know, from some other location in Southern California into the city of Los Angeles, right? It's, it's probably going to trigger that higher minimum wage and you want to make sure that you're paying attention to that as well. Okay, there's impact of minimum wage increases in different ways. Remember as things change, um, anything on that wage theft notice of Labor Code Section 2810.5, that's where you have to, for non-exempt employees, tell them um, how much they're making you know, for their straight time and for their time and a half, double time, you have to give them what the paid sick leave is, your workers' comp information, all of that. Just remember, um, if the only thing that changes is their base rate, then you don't have to give them a new wage theft notice because it'll be reflected on a pay stub. But if there's anything else you're changing, you want to reissue those. The other thing that comes into play is the minimum salary for exempt status. So this is tied to the state minimum wage, not any local municipality. So for employers with 25 or fewer employees, the new minimum salary for exempt status is 43,680. Um, Remember, there's still the duties test and that you want to make sure that people are properly classified. We still see a lot of problems with this, so by all means reach out to us if you need help um, with that analysis to make sure that people are properly classified. Um, you might remember that last year there was a lot of talk that the U.S. Department of Labor was recommending increase in the minimum salary threshold for exempt at the federal level. Um, it was going to be 47476 That increase was barred by the Fifth Circuit Court, and we're guessing that Trump's probably not going to be uh, changing that anytime soon. So for now, we're going to be at the state level, which is going to be higher. Uh, also remember that posters have to be updated. and. If of course, you're going to run into some issues with wage compression, meaning you might have people that have been at your company a while that are closer to that new minimum wage, but as you bump up your new entry-level people, you might have some problems with the people that have been there thinking they need to be paid more money. So if you need help nav navigating any of that, reach out to us to help you with that. Okay, a couple other wage and hour changes um, along, you know, these are indexed, so as the minimum wage changes in each year, actually, I think uh, these are indexed. So the minimum exempt salary for computer professionals is now over $90,000 a year. So sometimes I talk to clients, and they go, oh, our IT person, you know, he or she's exempt. And I say, how much are you paying them? They're like, oh, they're over that $40,000 mark, you know, or $45,000. And I'm like, no, no, it's twice that, right? $90,000. So that's the first easy analysis to do is look to say, hey, if we have computer professionals, are we paying them at that $90,000 mark? And if not, then you're not going to be able to have them as exempt unless they're going to qualify under some other white collar exemption like executive. 
licensed physicians and surgeons. We have a few healthcare clients out there. Those rate increases go to $79.39 an hour. Okay, this is a pretty big one that's going to affect a lot of companies in California. So everybody knows we have FMLA and CFRA. This mirrors the, those laws and to a certain extent, does not provide leave to care for family members with a serious health condition or the employee's own serious health condition um, or for pregnancy, anything like that. But for the purpose of baby bonding, now essentially the same rules from FMLA and CFRA with respect to baby bonding apply to companies that have 20 or more employees within a 75 mile radius. Okay, So this is going to extend that same 12 weeks of protection job protection, right, um, for the child's birth, adoption, or placement. It has to be within the first year um, after you get the baby um, or child. You have to maintain group health insurance, just like our rules on FMLA and pregnancy leave, and you can, of course, not retaliate toward any employee for taking advantage of this. The employee has the same eligibility requirements. They have to have 12 months of service with the company, and in the prior 12-month period, they have to have worked at least 1,250 hours. Um, but you definitely want to take some action on this, revise your handbook, and then also there's the notice that you're going to be required uh, to provide employees upon um, their request to take such a leave so they know what their rights are. And of course, um, along with the rest of the leave of absence paperwork that you should be providing them. Um, it's unpaid by the company, but employees can apply for paid family leave through the state. Okay, this is another big one that everybody's been talking about. It's in the news. AB 168 has to do with salary history in which you can no longer ask candidates effective January 1st. So it prohibits companies from making future hiring decisions and also offers them employment based on the applicant's prior wage history. You are no longer allowed to ask during the interview process um, or prior to your offer, hey, how much did you make at your last company? So think about your application forms. Um, almost all of them in that experience you know, section has from to in terms of wages. You need to remove those from your applications. Um, you cannot ask for it. What's unique about this law to me is that it does say you're allowed to use the information if it was voluntarily provided without prompting. So if you think about this, this is very different from most laws. Most laws will say, hey, um, if during the interview process you find out the person has you know, a disability, you find out the person's age, their race, that they're pregnant, you're not allowed to consider that in making the offer. This has that unique characteristic that if the candidate voluntarily provides it, you haven't prompted them, then that's okay. But otherwise, you're not to ask at any point during that during the recruiting or interview process about their prior history. Okay, The other thing about this, it says upon request that you have to provide the candidate with the pay scale for the position. Now, I've read this bill. It does not have any advice on what that means. It doesn't have any definition. It doesn't even say that it has to be in writing. Um, what it does say is that if they ask, you have to tell them what the range is for the position. T to me, that means that the range could be, hey, we pay $12 an hour for this job. There's your range, right? It could be that you have a formal structure and we're happy to connect you with compensation consultants if you want to do a full study. Um, it does not tell you uh, how to do it or what you have to provide them. It just says you have to provide them with the pay scale for the position. So you definitely are going to, again, want to review your application forms, remove any, any question about prior compensation on there, uh, take a look at your hiring process, and train your hiring managers and recruiters to stop asking those questions because I know that we all um, are such in a habit of doing that. And you want to make sure that that is not a conversation you're having prior to the offer being made. Um, it is, as far as I know, and it doesn't say anything in the law to prevent you from asking what their salary expectations are or how much they need to make going forward. You just can't ask about history. Okay, the next one, Senate Bill 396, has to do with harassment and prevention training. We all know that if you have 50 or more employees in the state of California, uh, managers must have two hours of interactive harassment prevention training every two years, and also remember within six months of becoming a supervisor. Um, this extends 
or expands that training requirement to include a discussion around gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation. There is also now, of course, protection in California for transgendered employees, and there's a new poster requirement. So that link I've put in there, um, if you click on that link, it will take you directly to the poster, and I put a, a shot of the top of the poster. That is a new requirement to be posted along with everything else. Also remember, um, a couple things about posters in general. If you have more than 10% of your employee population that has a primary language other than English, you're required to do most posters in that language. So if you have Spanish-speaking folks, for example, which a lot of our clients do, um, they do have this available in Spanish. I'm probably linking you to the English version, but if you go to that same page, you'll find the Spanish version and some other languages as well. Um, we do a lot of harassment prevention training, um, so if you need training done either in person or online, English, Spanish, those are our basic languages there, we're happy to uh, talk to you about providing that service. AB 1710, um, this mirrors the Uniform Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act of 1994, USERRA, which is a federal law, and it basically just says that if you have members of the armed services, you, you cannot discriminate against them uh, in any terms and conditions or privileges of employment. I'm not really sure why we need to do this. We already had that protection in place, both state and federal, but it just changed the language to sort of mirror USERRA. All right, uh, another fairly big change, this is an expansion of the Fair Employment and Housing Act. Um, the state of California has passed as sort of some leading uh, laws on this as far as I'm concerned in terms of the nation. So what they're planning on doing is eliminating any pronouns uh, like he or she from their vocabulary and all of their forms. So they're going to delete any gender specific personal pronouns in their anti-discrimination and their pregnancy disability and their FMLA or CFRA leave laws. Um, so it's instead of saying he or she, it'll say the person or the employee or the candidate or the applicant. Um, this has really caused me and Ivana, who many of you know, um, to think about, okay, we have to go back through our handbook, we have to go back through some of our forms and make sure that we are eliminating any of those references. Now, the other thing I already had a client ask me about is what about our HRIS system? Like what do we need to do about that? Um, it's interesting that you have to also take uh, the, if you have a box on your application form that asks if you're male or female, I'm going to talk about this again in a second, you have to remove that as well. So you need to think about revising your handbook and any other documents to remove those pronouns if they reflect any sort of gender. Now, the reason for that is also this bill, because um, the last one I just showed you about has to do with, with um, the government and what they're going to do with their documents. Uh, SB 179 is now sort of crossing over into private employers and just individuals in the state of California, and this has to do with gender identification. So going forward, and this is going to be phased in over the next couple of years, it's going to allow California residents to choose from three different gender options, female, male or non-binary, which pretty much means I don't fit into any of those. So you'll see it could be um, some people refer to themselves as um, agender, gender queer, gender fluid, two spirit, bigender, pangender, gender nonconforming, or gender variant. Um, so it's going to allow people to select that non-binary role. So the question also is, in our HRIS IS systems, do we need to have a box for non-binary? Well, I think that's going to be best practice going forward. So if, again, think about any forms that you have where people are answering um, that question, what, what is my gender, and make sure that you're including that third option because that is how we're going um, to move forward as, as far as the state of California is concerned. Definitely remove gender from the application form in general because it is now considered a protected class and also always keep the protected information separate from um, the employee's file, just like you would with the I-9 forms. You don't want to keep copies of the driver's license um, you know, that might show age, race, that type of thing. Um, another sort of just expansion of, of where we've been headed, and some states are ahead of us on this, is AB uh, 1008 is ban the box. So people refer to that as meaning you can no longer ask about criminal history until after an offer is made. So last year we had the extension into you can't ask about juvenile criminal history. Los Angeles already said you couldn't do this. Some other cities have 
um, joined in on this, but now this is statewide. So you cannot deny the applicant a position based on the criminal history until there is an individualized assessment performed, and they go through and they take a look at um, different things in terms of the nature of the crime relative to the position, how long ago. There's sort of the three different factor approach on that. They also have a very specific process that you are required to follow if you choose to withdraw your offer based on the background check. Um, most of you already know and you've gone through this with whoever's performing your background checks. Um, you know, we recommend Santoni Investigations to people. They take care of this. They will help you with this process. Um, but you want to make sure that if you decide to withdraw the offer, that you are notifying everybody uh, the way that you have to according to this law. So it's a very specific process. There's a five-day period where they can appeal, all sorts of other things that go along with that. Um, again, revise your applications to remove any questions having to do with criminal history um, and just let to me, just let the background check company take care of that for you. Let them uh, give the employee the forms that they have to be that have to be completed with all of the proper releases. Okay, AB 450. Um, a lot of people refer to, to California as a sanctuary state. Um, this isn't related directly to that. It's a different law, but it has to do with sort of protecting um, employees, uh, f you know, from ICE if immigration uh, shows up and wants to come in and walk through your plant, walk through your company. Uh, you are not allowed to voluntarily let them go into non-public areas of your business until they have a warrant. So if they present you with a warrant and say, hey, we have a warrant, we're coming in to do this, of course, you're going to be obligated to comply with that warrant. I would always say, hey, pick up the phone and call Marla first, um, let her give you some advice on that, but you're, that's fine, but you cannot just have them show up, knock on your door and say, hey, we'd like to walk through your plan, take a look around, cannot do it. So ICE, Homeland Security, whoever it is. Um, you also cannot allow them to access, review, or obtain employee records. There are some exceptions um, that you can look at in the law, but you're not allowed to provide them with that unless they have a subpoena for those documents. The one sort of exception to all this is if uh, USAIS says, hey, we're coming in to do an I-9 audit, um, they have to give you some notice, and you have 72 calendar hours to provide written notice to the employees that, hey, your I-9 form may be affected by this. Um, it depends. They may tell you the I-9 forms that they want to see, but most likely they're just going to say, hey, we're going to show up and, and look at your I-9 forms. So you would have to give this notice to everybody. Notice that you also have to give in the employee's language. Okay, so think about this. One of the articles I was reading said, so suppose it happens where they show up noon on Friday, give you notice that they're going to come back on Monday. You're going to have to scramble to have an attorney help you with that language that has to be put in writing and provided to the employees, you know, so you can give them 72 hours notice and you also have to be able to do it in their primary language. Um, so that's going to be an issue. The fines for violation of this law are pretty steep. They're from 2000 to 10000 per violation. And I don't know yet how that's going to be interpreted. Is it per employee? Is it per incident? Um, so you want to make sure that you are definitely in compliance with this. So train HR, train reception, train other managers, your general manager, whoever would get involved um, if Homeland Security or ICE showed up uh, to make sure that they know what to do and how to handle it. Okay, victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, or stalking. This went into effect actually last July, so you've heard us talk about it once before. Just as a reminder, you must provide employees with written notice of their rights um, so they can take protected time off for medical treatment or legal proceedings. This only applies to employers with 25 or more employees. Again, I've posted the link for you so you can go download this notice um, that was already uh, published. Uh, make sure you're posting the notice. If you're buying your, your uh, notices through like CalChamber or some other service like that, most likely they've already updated it, but you just want to double check and make sure you have that. And then if somebody comes to you, some Somebody comes to you and says, hey, this is what's going on with me. Obviously recognize that they have the right to take the time off and provide them with that notice again. 
again, something that we've already talked about a couple times. In fact, if you go out to our YouTube channel, uh, Marla has one as well, but if you go out to Ethos HCS on YouTube, you'll see our prior webinars out there. Um, earlier in the year, January or February, I want to say, we did um, an I-9 webinar. We had Monica Lukacek on, who's an immigration attorney, and we talked about the form and immigration issues in general. Um, in July, a new form was released again that you had to start using by September, and I've seen a lot of my clients when I go into audit their I-9 forms not be using the correct form. So you want to make sure that you're using the form that has this rev date on it in the lower left-hand column. A lot of times we look at the expiration date and we think that's the date we're going by, but that's not the case. You need to look at the the rev date is in the lower left hand corner and make sure it says 7 17 2017 and it has an N with an asterisk next to it because that's the only form that's valid at this time in the US. Again, audit your I-9 forms, consider having us come in to do it. We've never come in to audit I-9 forms and not found mistakes and as Marla will tell you because um, she does a lot of transactional work, it there have been times with her clients where a deal has fallen through when a business owner wants to sell or merge with another company because of the I-9 forms. Um, so you want to try to avoid that. A couple other uh, requirements in terms of posters or notices. Um, there's human trafficking. This isn't specific to employers in general. Um, there's already existing law that requires alcohol retailers, airports, emergency rooms, and adult businesses to post notices um, that concern human trafficking and then offer a hotline that people can call um, if they need assistance. Uh, so AB 260 extends that to hotels, motels, and inns, and SB 225 um, basically says now you also have to give them like a number they can text if they need support. So this is very specific to these industries, so if you operate um, in any of these industries, make sure that you are complying with this law. Okay, and again, um, we have a couple of clients in this industry. If you're in barbering and cosmetology, uh, a couple of dif different things. One is SB 490. It's just going to add the ability to uh, pay commission on top of an hourly base rate if certain conditions are met. So if you're in this industry, take a look at that bill. Um, and then also, uh, there's training that has to be done on sexual assault awareness in this required health and safety course for licenses. So there's now this requirement, I should say, they already have to do the safety course, now there's a requirement to include uh, information on physical and sexual assault. Okay, a couple more slides for me before I turn it over to Marla. Um, workplace safety. Um, so this is an interesting one because uh, I've worked in manufacturing a lot, we have a lot of clients in that space. I used to be in charge of safety a long time ago back in the day and so we had to maintain all of the material safety data sheets for all of the chemicals we use in the plant. This is actually now expanded to include janitorial type products. So manufacturers, if you have cleaning supplies you know, that you're buying from manufacturers, they're now required to disclose the chemicals and create that product safety data sheet um, and send it out to you. So you need to make sure that you have those available along with the rest of your MSDSs. So if you have, you know, a notebook out on the floor or whatever, make sure you're including the, the janitorial supplies as well as the regular uh, materials you're using out in the plant or somewhere else in the office. Another uh, requirement AB 44, this relates to terrorist attacks, sort of a random thing if you ask me in terms of this law, but it requires employers to provide support from a nurse case manager um, to, that should say employees, injured in the course of employment by an act of domestic terrorism. Um, so this only applies if the governor declares a state of emergency in connection with an act of domestic terrorism. I guess you know this probably did happen uh, up in Sacramento earlier. Uh, so if somebody is injured, you're going to have to provide them, you know, with some sort of support from a nurse case manager just to make sure that they get through that. Uh, and that's it, I think, for me. Um, so I know that was super fast, that's why we put all of the numbers of the bills in there is just to make sure you can go back and read up on them, just Google it, it'll pull up the actual bill text. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Marla so she can talk about case law and a couple of enforcement bills that came up recently. Thank you, Linda. Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Holidays to everybody and thank you for supporting us through the last several years where we've been doing our webinars. Um, clearly we have not 
provided you with all the new laws. Linda and I try really hard to pull the ones that we know of are always concerned to our clients and then the ones that apply to all that we think are the most important. And that one of the first areas of case law that I want to talk about is arbitration agreements. Over the last several years, um, the, the state and enforceability of arbitration agreements in the employment context especially, but overall in just arbitration, it's been tumultuous flux over the last several years. And this has been particularly true with respect to class action waivers. We've got a, a split in the courts as to whether or not to uphold class action waivers. We currently have in front of the U.S. Supreme Court Epic Systems versus Lewis, which should define which side of the split is correct. I was hoping it would come out before our webinar today because it, we are expecting it sometime this this month. Um, the PAGA claims here in California, which I hope we will do a webinar on in March, um, won't be, likely be effective. But we are hoping from the employer, employer side, obviously, that the class action waivers will be upheld. If you have not had your arbitration agreements reviewed in the last couple of years, or if you are still currently using an arbitration agreement that's found in your employment application or in your employment handbook, your employee handbook, I recommend you contact one of us, uh, either Linda's firm or our firm, and have that changed because we've had some case law suggest that the arbitration agreement should be separate. And we've had additional language come out um, post Armendaris uh, that should be included in the arbitration agreement. So we've had quite a few revisions, and then again, hopefully we'll get the last revision uh, this month sometime. I threw Beck versus Stratton in here um, <laughs> just to kind of to put a little fear in everyone. Uh, not that it, it really brought out any new law. It's just a, a very sad story of, about you know an employee who sued for wages and penalties and received an award of six thousand dollars, and the employer appealed the award to the Superior Court and lost. And was uh, the employee was awarded attorney's fees of thirty-one thousand dollars and some change, quite a bit more than the six thousand. And the employer tried to argue that this was unreasonable because how high it was and compared to the award of the wages. And the court said no, no, it's you know the attorney's fees are oftentimes very much higher, and and this was reasonable, and um, you have to pay it. So I throw this in here to put a little bit of fear in everyone, um, so that you'll think to call Linda or us before deciding whether or not to proceed with defense of a, a wage and hour claim. The next one, Vaccaro versus Stoneledge Furniture is also Ashley Furniture. Most of you, I'm sure, know about Ashley, Ashley Furniture. They operate several retail furniture stores throughout California. They were employing inside sale associates to sell furniture on the sales room floor. And to be exempt from overtime in California, as you know or may not know, inside salespeople must be paid one and a half times minimum wage for all hours worked and must receive at least half their compensation from commission on sales. Uh, prior to the lawsuit, Ashley Furniture was paying its sales employees $12 per hour, eight, the $8 minimum wage at the time, plus the $4 half um, for all hours worked, including in that was the time spent on rest breaks. And the court held no employers with inside commission salespeople must now separately pay for all rest breaks. Uh, um, as an alternative pay structure, inside sales employees can be paid minimum wage for all hours work plus a month end bonus for meeting various sales goals. Otherwise, they have to be paid a separate paycheck for their rest periods. And of course, if they don't, there's the penalty that goes with that, and that's one hour of pay for the day. So the next case um, that applies to everybody is the California Supreme Court case, um, Augustus versus ABM Security Services that dealt with on-call rest breaks. This is really a difficult one for us employers to swallow. These were safety guards, uh, excuse me, security guards, and it was a class action brought on, on their behalf um, for rest break penalties. Um, the, these guards were required to keep their radios and pagers turned on at all times, inclu including during their rest breaks. Now, many of the times they, they were never called or asked to do anything, but they were re required to keep them on. Um, a little bit uh, factual, one of the facts that came against the employer was that they were also required to remain at their post. And as most of you know, on call, you, if you're allowed to go and, and do your personal work and, and leave the premises, then you're, you're going to be okay. Here, they didn't have that. So um, the court upheld penalties for the missed rest breaks and required them to, to be paid for the rest breaks. 
The next case, that Mendoza versus Nordstrom, who I'm sure everyone has heard of, of, of Nordstrom. Uh, California law requires that all employees be provided with one day off in seven. And this was a, a great case for us because the court held that one day off in a work week complies with the law. It does not have to be a rolling seven day period. Where What's important here is to look in your handbook and make sure that you have defined what the work week is because the employer has the right to do that. Your week, work week can be Sunday through Saturday. It can be Monday through uh, Sunday. But you need to define it so that you know whether or not your employee has received the one day off in seven that the, the law requires that they have. So Minick versus automatic, uh, Automotive Creations. This is probably um, the best case to point out the importance of, of legal drafting. Um, but also, for us attorneys, uh, it, it was really a turn from what the labor commissioner um, had opined with respect to vacation. Um, it, we had very often said to our clients when drafting vacation policies, please remember you don't have to have vacation, but if you offer vacation to be competitive in the labor pool, you have to comply with certain rules. And the cases that we had prior to this made it very clear that vacation was earned as a, an employee worked, and once it was earned and accrued, you couldn't take it away. You couldn't have forfeiture. What wasn't clear was whether or not you could say you don't earn any vacation the first year, but on the first day of the second year, you have one week's vacation. The labor commissioner had opined that that was not allowed because it was really more of a subterfuge, that it was really earned during that first year. And this court, Minnick said, no, that's not correct. If you write the policy correctly, and I, I, anybody who wants to read this case will see that the court used the word ambiguous, ambiguity several times, and said, if you have a clear policy that there is nothing earned during that first year, then, then there is nothing accrued and there is no forfeiture. It is okay to have one week available the first day of the second year. And then they would start accruing as it's, as it's earned for the second year to be applicable to the third year. It was, the policy was very clearly stated in plain English. It explained it twice and the, and the court deemed that we could do this. This is great for my clients because I've always asked if they can do that. We've always said, no, we don't think you can because of the opinion of the, the labor commissioner and now we can't. So for those employers who want to um, put off vacation, for those employees who might be terminated during that first year, um, and don't, don't want to have to pay, give us a call. Let's revise your, your policy, your handbook, um, and, and save that little extra money there. Okay, Rodriguez versus uh, Nike Retail Services. In this case, the court ruled that employees did not need to be paid for bag checks as they left the store uh, because the time was considered de minimis. In, the, in, in determining de minimis, the court looked at three factors. One, whether recording the time would be administratively difficult from a practical perspective. Imagine if you have 500 employees all trying to leave at the same time. Uh, two, the aggregate amount of time in question. Three, the regularity of the off-the-clock work. Uh, I, I need to let you know that there's another case called Franklin versus Apple, and yes, it is Apple as in the iPhone Apple, that had the same uh, outcome. The court ruled that, that it was de minimis as they were checked Bags, employees' bags were checked when they left. However, that case has been accepted to be heard by the California Supreme Court. So we're going to hear some uh, something from the court on this that may overturn even Rodriguez versus Nike Retail. But as of right now, the law stands that it, it is allowed as long as it's de minimis. So you need to review your practices regarding this unpaid time and consider these three factors. Okay, that's, I have two legislative slides that Linda's included for me. One is AB 1701, which is Contractors Joint Labor Liability. And this provides that all construction contractors are going to be jointly liable for the wage and hour violations of their subcontractors for all contracts um, entered into after January 1, 2018. This is very frightful. If you are in construction, please seek out either my help, Linda's help, or another attorney's help with respect to your construction contact contracts. You want to make sure that you can put into your subcontractor agreement some protections. You'll never be able to protect from the subcontractor who doesn't have enough money or goes bankrupt. 
uh, and you'll end up being responsible, but that, that tells you some of the things you need to do with respect to reference checking, bank checking, um, with respect to your subcontractors because you're going to have that joint labor liability now. The next one is AB 306, and it's an expansion of DLSE enforcement actions. Uh, existing law prohibits an employer from retaliating against an employee who engages in protected conduct, such as reporting suspected or known violations, um, to a supervisor or a government official. The DLSE will now also be able to in initiate an investigation if it su suspects the employer retaliated against an employee who engaged in protected conduct. And, and the employee can obtain a preliminary injunction against the employer upon a mere showing of reasonable cause. And I, I, this makes me think of Linda's slide on uh, ICE not being allowed to come in without a warrant because the DLSE can come in at any time without a warrant and just ask to see your, your records, um, your employment records. They have that right. So I thought it was a little ironic that California said the feds can't come in, but we can come in. <laughs> And I think that that's it. I, I speak a little faster than you, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can keep up with you, but yeah. <laughs> Right. I thanks for that information. There was a lot that was covered today. I know that um, we do have some questions, and I know we want to allow uh, as much time as possible to get uh, to as many questions as we can. So let me look at this. The first question came in from Jim, and this one I think is geared for you, Marla. How does this impact new hire, or I should say, how does the Rodriguez and Nike retail services case that you mentioned, how does that impact new hire orientation when employees are asked, or I should say employers, ask employees to complete the paperwork ahead of time? Many companies have gone to where they send you the paperwork via email, they expect you to complete it, and then bring it in on your first day. Did we lose Marla? I hope we didn't lose Marla. <laughs> no, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, Sorry, okay. I had muted. Um, that's a great, great question, um, and, I, and I'll caveat or you know caution. My answer may change depending on what the California Supreme Court does in Franklin versus Apple stores. Um, but right now, you you have to consider those three factors. Um, you know, are you sending paperwork that's going to take a minute and a half to fill out? Or are you sending an hour and a half worth of paperwork? Um, and what is required to complete that paperwork? Is it considered de minimis information, you know, name, address, phone number? Or are you requiring them to do something more? So you have to look at it, and each, each employer is going to have to look at it independently and make a determination. Well, of course, I'm a very conservative person, so I always err on the side of caution. And if it's, if it's not going to be truly de minimis, and by that I, w I would say you know, 10 minutes or less, you're looking at potentially paying for that time. That's great. Uh, Marla, another question just came in from Nicole, and she was asking, are we allowed, because we talked a little bit earlier about the break times, are we allowed to restrict EES from leaving the premises during breaks because we are paying for them? Yes. Okay. So, let's... Marla, I heard recently that that changed. Um, I'm trying to think of the case, but I re remember, I think slight. I'm going to give a slightly different answer, Denise, to that. Uh, it used to be we'd always write the handbooks to say because it's on the clock that we're allowed to keep them on the premises. But I believe something just changed that you can no longer restrict them. So we can get back to you guys on that. But um, yeah. It was always so long as you had a place for them to eat, it was okay. But I've, I'll, we'll, we'll double check it. Linda, you and I can double check it. And if it's changed, we'll shoot an email out to all the attendees. Yeah, exactly. Okay, great. We have a lot of questions coming in. Uh, if we don't get to your question today, uh, we'll make sure that we get back to you. Um, we have a question in from Melody, and Melody wants to know, how do we deal with SB 179 and EEO reporting now if we don't require the employee to identify their gender? How do we know what to report? Yeah, so you're still going to have to um, you are going to have to collect that information, but the best practice is you're going to do it after you hire somebody. Um, we don't know how it's going to 
how it's going to show up, but you want to keep it separately. Like your self-identification form for EEO one purposes, you're going to want to keep that separate and have it be a voluntary identification like it is now if you're disabled, if you're a vet, whatever. So you can still ask that for that information, but it's going to be separately and probably after the fact. The bigger question to me is what are you going to do about affirmative action companies, right, who have an affirmative responsibility to go out and recruit, um, you know, female something or other. I don't know what they're going to do. Are they going to start saying at the federal level, now we have to recruit a certain number of non-binary, you know, professionals? I don't know. Right now this is California specific though, so just make sure that if you have to collect that information for EO one purposes, you maintain it separately from the files wherever you would keep your EEO1 you know, data sheets. Great, thanks for that. Uh, we have another question here from Terry, and Terry would like to know, on the employment application, can we continue to ask salary desired, or is that going to be off limits with the new law? There's nothing in the law that when I read it, and Marla, you weigh in if you read something differently, there's nothing in the law as I read it that um, would require you to take that information off. It's specific to history. So I think during the interview process and on your application form, you're still fine asking what are your compensation expectations or desired salary or something like that. You just cannot ask about history. I agree with that. Nothing, okay, nothing good. from the past. So you have to be very careful. I, I, I can't stress enough the importance of that Minic decision that we got. You have to be very, very clear in your drafting. Okay, great. Um, question in from Deborah. It, uh, Linda, you, we talked a lot about I-9 forms earlier and the need to do the audit. Uh, is, it ex is it acceptable to ask all employees to fill out the new version of the I-9 form, or is it best only to, cre to collect the new version going forward? You absolutely are prohibited from asking all of your existing employees to fill out a new I-9 form. And we have had this happen before, and is disastrous, right? We did an audit earlier this year for a client that was selling their business, um, and there were just they made up new ways to screw up the I-9 forms. To be honest with you, um, it was bad. They had asked them to complete new I-9 forms on multiple occasions. They gave them the Spanish version, which can only be used in Puerto Rico. Um, just a multitude of things. So that's why I say, you know, think about having us come in to do an audit. We worked really closely um, with their counsel. Um, and went through just, I can't even tell you, we spent weeks going through and uh, taking a look at all of their forms and then fixing them the correct way to try to minimize any liability. Um, it's The requirement is going forward, you will have new, new people that you're hiring uh, fill out the new form, but you do never go back in time and have them complete a new form. Now, the one exception would be if you're recertifying somebody, uh, you use the then current form. So let's say that somebody had an employment authorization that expired, um, that expires tomorrow, right? Um, you do not recertify on the old form they filled out two years ago when they, you hire them. You would attach the new form to um, the old form and recertify on that on that version, um, but you don't go back and have anybody complete a new form. So if you need help on how to fix the problem, if you've been doing that, then reach out to us and, and we can come in and help you fix uh, that situation the, the right way. And to Linda's point when she was um, presenting her slide, I have had the unfortunate circumstance where we've had sales of companies um, be canceled because of errors in the I-9s. And, and the unfortunate part is that there are errors that can, under the law, be corrected if they're corrected correctly. <laughs> you're right. allowed to correct under the way they tell you you're allowed to correct. So, um, And then it's not so frightening. But um, yeah, if you haven't audited your I-9s, I promise you that there's an error somewhere. So I would encourage you to get Without them audited. Without a doubt. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, seriously, this was potentially not only ruining the sale, but potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars in penalties um, that this company would have had had you know s someone from immigration walked in to audit their files. They were just a mess. So it can be fixed to Marla's point, uh, but you need to know how to fix it the proper way. And we're, again, happy to come in and, and help you with that process. Yeah, and lastly, just to remind everybody, there's because a lot of people don't 
remember this, there are two ways to, to be fined and penalized under the law with respect to I-9s. A lot of people think it's just, well, I, don't, I know I don't have any workers who not, are not authorized to work in the United States. That's just one of the areas. The second is if the document, the I-9 itself, is not properly done. If it's not if it's not properly completed, if the correct documents weren't used, there's penalties just for that. And again, they can be corrected, but the penalties get get placed on if they haven't been corrected. Yeah, it's definitely the way they set up the penalties a money grab. It's it's yeah. something like a hundred dollars per problem. So it's not like a hundred dollars per form. It's like oh, you didn't put the date in the right nomenclature. That's a hundred dollars here, here, and here. Um, you forgot to line through this, or you forgot to put not applicable here. Um, each form can be fined. It's something like up to it's around twenty six hundred dollars per form. So it's it goes quickly. And if you did go back in time and have multiple forms. Um, each one of those forms could have problems on it. So it's definitely something you want to take a look at. Okay, um, we have another question from Charlene, and she's curious, and maybe you want to just go over this a little bit, Linda. Um, can we ask about criminal history after an offer has been made, but before we run a background check? And the concern in the question is, if the person doesn't tell the truth, can we withdraw our offer without... Um, because they didn't provide a, a an honest answer. Interesting. Um, that's a great idea, Charlene. I don't know anything that would prohibit you from doing that. Um, Marla, can you think of anything? I, I mean, the law says very clearly you can't ask the question before a conditional offer is made. You can make the offer condition upon passing the background check. Again, you have to go through a certain analysis if you want to withdraw the offer. Um, but Marla, do you see any reason they wouldn't be able to withdraw the offer based on the fraudulent completion of or answer that question? I don't because the 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 law is clear that it's you can't do it before. So once the conditional offer has been there, instead of doing the background check, you could just ask someone, and if they owned up to it, you know, make a decision there. Um, and and it, it it is a good idea. I have you know. Um, we, we do work with San Antonio Investigations also and McNeil Investigations, so we prepare their documents for the consent for the background check and it may even be something you add to to that so that the employer is not asking, the, the investigator is asking, but I don't see any problem with it being asked so long as it comes after the conditional offer. Okay. Uh, we had a couple questions come in about uh, the posters. Uh, Lindy mentioned the need to have updated posters in your organization. Um, will the transgender information be on the 2018 posters? Do you know that off the top of your head, Linda? I don't know. I do know that when I referred, um, I always just refer people to Cal Chamber because they've got an all-encompassing poster. Um, they have not, they are taking orders for the 2018 posters, so I think like a lot of us, we're sort of waiting to see if anything else comes in in the last couple of weeks of the year before we, you know, finalize that handbook or put up that poster. So I'm assuming that it will be included, but that's going to be specific to the publisher of the poster. Um, so at the worst case scenario, go go right now, download the poster that I gave you the link to and put it up. But if you are buying your posters or you're on their annual update, just make sure that it's included in there. If not, you can always post it separately. But my guess is, yes, it is a requirement under the law, so, so Cal Chamber is not dumb. They're going to go ahead and include it in there. Okay, and I think this might have to be our last question because we're running up on time. Um, we have a question here from Sirocco, and he said, could you please discuss the AB 1701 one more time? How can a contractor protect themselves? This is a hard one. Um, the best protection a contractor can do is, is one, do some, some background investigation on, on your subcontractors. You know, get a bank reference. Um, get references from, from customers, depending on what kind of contra contracts you're doing. But also in your, your subcontract agreement, you can have, have indemnification language in case uh, the employee comes after you as a contractor um, and not their subcontractor. Because if you're considered joint, the employee can go after either. So you need, there's provisions you need to have put into your, con your construction contracts with the subcontractor. Uh, but your best protection is to do your background investigation <laughs> Um, on your your subcontractor, make sure that they're financially strong. That they, you know, check their payroll practices, who they're using for payroll, if they're doing their payroll inside, those kinds of things. 
Yeah, and so Rocco, reach out to Marla, have her review your agreements. Um, Marla was kind to say, or reach out to Ethos, but don't reach out to us on those agreements. <laughs> reach out to re reach out to your attorney, and I know you guys work with Marla, so um, definitely have her re re review your agreements to see if there's some sort of indemnification that can be put in place um, or something, because like Marla said, it's really, that is truly a scary bill, and I get it on one hand because you might have some employers who go out of business and leave the employee hanging, but wow, to make, you know, to make someone that, that subcontracted work to you responsible for that just seems a little overkill to me, but um, that is what we are stuck with until somebody gets that changed. So Denise, thank you so much for handling all of the questions and answers for us. I just have a couple slides to tell people about um, some upcoming seminars and our next webinar. Uh, so I know you guys just sat through our hour. We gave you the highlights for everything. If you want a more detailed seminar on this, um, I am doing this with HR Network uh, in January. It's going to be January 9th. It's going to be a half day. So you're going to get a lot more information, a lot more detailed, or if you know of other people that weren't able to attend today that might want to come to something in, per in person, this is going to be held in Garden Grove. Um, $20 a person just to cover the cost of breakfast. You can email Vicki. Um, at ethoshcs.com to register and she'll take care of getting you on um, signed up for that. It's going to be more detailed and there, we're also going to have a special section on interviewing without salary or criminal history and then how to you know hire and onboard people um, in this new era of what you can and cannot do. So that's the same legal update um, but it's going to be for uh, 2018 uh, in January. Also, um, some of you might have attended, we had a PXT showcase not too long ago where uh, people from Wiley came out and presented the PXT assessment. We're going to do another one of those on productive conflict. So, wow, I wish I was in a room full of people I can say, how many people in here have never had any conflict in your workplace? Because not a single hand would go up. We get these calls all the time, you know, so and so is not getting along with so and so, or these two departments fight all the time. If you want to really learn how to harness the power of conflict and turn it into productive conflict that actually can help you build your business and move it forward, then this is for you. Um, I'm happy to have you come as my guest. I'll cover the cost of it. It's two hours, January 23rd in the morning, somewhere in Irvine. Not sure where yet. Um, the people from Wiley are going to just do a quick presentation and give you the overview on sort of what destructive and productive conflict behaviors are. It is related to DISC. This is part of their Everything DISC uh, platform. Uh, understand how to manage response to those situations and how they go through and talk about communication strategies. I did the beta with a couple of my clients and it was pretty powerful. They got a lot out of it. If you want more information on productive conflict itself and that program, there's a link at the bottom and again if you'd like to be my guest for that showcase just send an email off to Vicki and she will get you registered. Um, and finally thank you so much for attending today. Um, thank you to Marla and Denise as always. Our next, we're, I'm saying next month but it's going to be February 8th. Our next webinar is going to be February 8th 11 o'clock to noon and we're going to do what everybody's talking about the Me Too movement sexual harassment in the workplace. Um, it's, it's such an important thing to talk about. Obviously, it's in the news all the time now. You need to know what to do, what your responsibilities and rights are with regard to your employees, um, how to protect the company, um, what happens when third parties get involved, all sorts of things, and where those boundaries are. So we'll give you some best practices there. This will not be compliant with AB 1825 training. So this is not designed to our training for managers. This is uh, simply to give you an overview and sort of discuss the law and some best practices. The link is right there to register and of course we'll be sending out the link in a newsletter sometime coming up in the future. And we are coming in right on time it looks like. Um, so with that I'm going to just wish everybody a Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Holidays um, and say thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you found this useful, and if we did not for some reason get your question, uh, we'll follow up with you or feel free to shoot us an email. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. This will conclude our webinar for today. Thank you for attending.